Good morning to all of you. If you have your Bibles this morning, please turn in the Old Testament to the book of Isaiah, chapter 6. Book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, chapter 6. I'm going to start reading in verse 1. <clears throat> There, Isaiah 6, 1 says, In the year of King Uzziah, or the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. He was high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Actually, this version says, He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, or angels, each having six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And they were calling out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook the temple to its foundation, and the entire building was filled with smoke. Then I said, I'm ruined, <laughs> or uh, I'm done, or it's over. I am doomed, for I'm a, I'm a sinful man. I have filthy, unclean lips, and I live among a people with filthy, unclean lips. Yet I have seen the King of the Lord of Heaven's armies. Verse 6 says, Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips. And with it said, See, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Then I heard the Lord asking, Whom shall I send this message to, this people? Who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, Lord. Send me. Wow, think about what just happened there. <clears throat> We have a young man named Isaiah living in Israel thousands of years ago. He is caught up somehow miraculously into heaven's very throne room. And he sees the Lord God sitting on a throne. And I don't know if you've ever seen the Queen of England. Have any of you ever seen or met the Queen of England? Anybody in here? Well, <clears throat> I'm too young to remember this. But on her wedding day, she had a robe on her that went the whole length of the church and out the door. And she had servants behind her as she went down for her wedding day. I don't know if you brides ever consider this, having a train that's like two miles long. And, and as she's going to the altar to get married, there's like 15, 20 people holding this train of her robe down the, the aisle there. Mackenzie, don't get any ideas about this. No, yeah. don't do that. <laughs> and uh, it was to show her royalty. It was a display of, hey, I'm the bride. It's my day. And I'm living large. And all eyes are on me. You know, because brides are like that. <laughs> they went, oh, it's my day. And, uh, you know, it's, it's okay. We're okay with that. We love the brides and when they're all beautiful. And, and they're showing off and everything. That's cool. I think it's godly, biblical. But it's only a mere reflection of the holiness of the train of God Almighty. He is wonderful and, and beautiful and miraculous. And I, I don't have enough you know, superlatives to say what he is. And his robe went in this way and that way. And it's folding over itself. And it's so big and it's so vast and so holy. That it filled the whole temple. He's sitting on his throne and his robe just like made the rounds all through there. And then there's angels flying above him. And all they do, all they do is say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And, you know, it, it, is, it said their voices shook the foundation. I mean, I believe heaven's built on a good foundation. It's not going to crack or anything. But when's the last time you were somewhere where people were worshiping God and, and things shook. I read about uh, Paul and Silas being in jail praising God at midnight after they'd been beaten, and the ground shook. 
You know, there are, there are times when God just honors prayer and praise like that. And in heaven, it's always rocking and it's always shaking and it's like smokes there. It's like a rock concert is a pale, very pale resemblance of the holy spectacle that's awaiting us at the, at the throne of God. And, and my point is this. There's a young kid named Isaiah. He may have been 16. He may have been 19. I don't know his exact age, but he was a young man. And he's witnessing all this, and his reaction is, this is so holy, and this is so sacred, I got no business being here. Do you know who I am? Do you know where I come from? Man, I come, I come from some foul people, man, who use bad language and who watch bad movies and who watch Oprah and do all these things. Oh, sorry, I said Oprah again. Forgive me for that. Take that back. Erase that from the tape. I'm not here to diss Oprah. She'll have her judgment. Don't watch it again. Never mind. Sorry about that. Forgive Oprah, Lord. Save her soul in Jesus' name. Amen. Moving on. Isaiah's there. I'm sorry, I had to do that for myself. Uh, Isaiah's there and he's witnessing this and he feels automatically unworthy. What am I even doing here? I'm undone, he says. I'm, I'm through. I'm, that's it. I'm done. It's, it's hopeless, me being here. I'm just going to you know, just disintegrate in the presence of such holiness. And while he's thinking this and while he's saying that, one of the angels flies over to this altar in heaven that has burning coals. That's the real altar. There was a representative one in Israel in, in their temple. But this is the real one in heaven's court. And the angel takes a pair of tongs and takes one of those, those uh, red hot coals and places it on the lips of Isaiah to say, Now your mouth is clean. Now your sins are forgiven. Now you're purged. Now you're ready to proclaim the holy word that comes from heaven's throne to this sinful, awful people. You're going to be God's messenger. You're going to speak God's word to them. You know, and of course, he's given the choice. He's saying, the Lord says, who will I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah, knowing he's unworthy, Knowing that the only reason he's standing there is because that coal from the fire has purged him and made him somewhat holy. And he said, here am I. Send me. I'll go. And, and you know what? From time to time in history, God has reached down and chosen and called people who felt that they were not worthy. Who felt that they couldn't live up to it. They didn't have the pedigree or they didn't have the vocal ability or the the knowledge or the skills. And, and one such man in our day was Billy Graham. And many of you know he passed away at the ripe age of 99. <laughs> if he'd hung in there in November of this year, he would have been 100 years old. And they say he couldn't really speak that well towards the end, but he could hear. And he was alert. And he could listen. And if you would go visit him, he would hold your hand and look you in the eye, and he would listen to everything you would say. And when, if you prayed with him, I mean, this is what the people are saying, he would say amen to that towards the end. But he was still with it. This is the heritage of a godly man. This is the heritage of a man that God chooses. But when Billy Graham was a very young man, uh, he wasn't so hot. <laughs> he wasn't really that good at preaching. As a matter of fact, his very first sermon... He preached it. He had like five pages of notes. He preached it in eight minutes. The congregation is out there in eight minutes. And he, did, he read all his notes. And he's standing there and the clock is still ticking. And everybody's staring at him. So he made the singer sing a song and he made a hasty exit. Left that day feeling like, what a failure. You know, all these people are raising this money to send me to Bible college. And I can't even preach a sermon for a half an hour. I'm done in eight minutes. What a messed up, washed up person I am. And, and you know what? Somehow along the way he got encouraged and he tried again. And he learned. And that awful preacher from North Carolina, that young gangly man who could hardly speak, he spoke so fast that he went through his notes in eight minutes. He, he became quite a formidable speaker. And one day, the Lord had blessed him. The Lord reached out and said, I can use a humble guy like this. I can use somebody like this. And before he knew it, he was in a crowded tent in Los Angeles. And a man named William Randolph Hearst. Anybody ever heard of him? Hearst Broadcasting. One of the most famous newspaper men of his day in the 19, 
1800s, beginning of the 20th century as well, said two words, Puff Graham. Said that to all his newspapers all over America, and pretty soon everybody knew about this preacher boy from North Carolina who was setting up tents all over America preaching the gospel. Now God had to find a man, God had to prepare a man, and then God blessed a man and gave him the words to say. And, and for all that time, most of our lifetime, and, and before we were, some of us were even born, Jimmy, I'm sorry, Billy, <laughs> Jimmy's another sermon. <laughs> I'll give you the Jimmy sermon next time. <laughs> Freddie Graham. <laughs> Civil word like Billy, and I, could, I couldn't get it right. Can you rewind that again? That's it. So Billy Graham was available. He was faithful, and God made him powerful. And one of the songs that they would always sing during his meetings was the one we sang this morning, Just As I Am. Come to God as you are. That was the message that Billy Graham preached. Come to God as you are, yeah, but don't stay as you are. That's the key. That's the full gospel. Come to the Lord as you are, but repent. Bring your baggage. Bring your sin. Yeah, bring it, but leave it at the cross of Christ. And Billy Graham, did I say this right? <laughs> Joey Graham said, or through his ministry, the Lord brought millions to Christ. How many ministries can you put your thumb on and say, Millions of people have been documented to have gone forward and given their hearts and souls to Jesus Christ. Now, what did this do for America? Churches were filled with new believers who were on fire for the gospel. And these people became fathers and mothers and uncles and aunts and raised children and went to work and, and, and were an impact on society. And America, as a result, was blessed. God's grace by one humble man who gave his heart and soul to Jesus entirely, who's preached a simple gospel, a simple gospel, millions of people got saved because the Lord blessed it. Amen. And I am very truly thankful for the ministry of Billy Graham. And I, I pray for America's sake that we get sent another Billy Graham. If, if there's one thing lacking in America right now, it is evangelism. I, I see Christianity, and I'm including myself in this, hunkering down under the weight and the pressure in, in, in the battle. We're hunkering down, and we're in defense mode. We got our helmets on, we got our foxholes dug, and we are taking a beating, but nobody's out there being offensive or playing offense for the gospel. We don't have, in my opinion, we do not have a Billy Graham in this country right now. And I don't, you know, I'm not trying to idolize the man. <laughs> but when God, in his sovereignty, chooses a man and empowers a man, his gospel goes forth and people get saved. And does America need a revival right now? Yeah. Do we need people shaken up and, and, and turned on to the gospel? It all starts with this, friends. We got to start praying. Billy Graham spent a lot of time on his knees praying, seeking God, searching the scriptures. And the Lord looked down and said, I can use a guy like that. Or I can use a girl like that. Maybe in your own little world, in your own sphere of influence, you'll be the little Billy or Bonnie Graham. <laughs> Where you go. And, and your, the Lord will take your simplicity of yourself. And he'll bless that with his Holy Spirit. And people will be convicted and turn from their sins. Wouldn't that be great? I hope that's your prayer. And I hope that's something that you can, you can see yourself doing. Being a light. Being a witness. It all starts with the simple gospel. What is that? I'm going to turn to the book of Acts. And I want you to hear a little bit of the very first gospel message that was ever given on planet Earth by a backwards, probably illiterate fisherman named Peter. He didn't have any theological degrees, but he did have this. He spent three and a half years living, walking side by side with, 
witnessing the life of Jesus of Nazareth. Saw him live, saw him die, saw him rise again. And Peter has this distinction too. He denied Jesus three times and the Lord personally looked him in the eye and said, I forgive you. Go and feed my sheep. Remember that portion of scripture? Feed my lambs. So here we have Peter on the day of Pentecost. They're waiting in prayer. The Spirit falls mightily. They're all empowered for the, for the service of the gospel. See, that's something I think we need. We're all saying we all love the Lord, but we lack the power to witness. Do you feel that? I feel that in my own personal life. I pray all the time, Lord, give me the power to witness. And I believe it was Paul who said in Romans 1, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. So if I'm lacking power in my life, I need to reconnect with what the gospel is. Good news. What's good news to a sinner? You're forgiven. What's good news to someone who's on the right, wrong track, I mean? You can get on the right track through Jesus. Not guilty. Be cleansed of your sins. Be, have your mind straightened out. That's good news to someone who's lost. Here's the way. That's what we need to get back to. The simplicity of the gospel. Everybody okay with that so far? Have I lost anybody on that point? The church lacks power because I think we've lost the gospel. We need to get back to that. Let me read this, this to you in Acts chapter 2. I'm going to start reading verse 32. You settle that kid down or I'll call him an usher. <laughs> this isn't a Pentecostal church. You be quiet, young lady. She don't listen to me. All right, in Acts chapter 2, verse 32. I'm sorry, sweetheart. You're so cute. I wish you were up here preaching and I was up there listening to you. In Acts 2, verse 32, it says, this is Peter in the middle, towards the end of his sermon on the day of Pentecost. He said in verse 32, God raised Jesus from the dead, and we are all witnesses of this. Now he's exalted to the place of highest honor in heaven. Remember, Isaiah had a vision of that. <clears throat> at God's right hand, and the Father, as he hath promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour upon us, just as you see and hear today. For David himself never ascended to heaven, yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies and make them a footstool under your feet. So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Christ, or Messiah. Peter's words pierced their hearts, and they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do to be saved? Peter replied, Each of you must repent. See that word? It means turn around, turn away. Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, to your children, and even Gentiles who have all been called by the Lord our God. This, my friend, is the gospel. This is the message of hope and salvation. His message wasn't really all that nice. I mean, if I looked out at you, and you didn't know me that well, and I said, your sins crucified Jesus, huh, I run the risk of offending you. And everybody knows in this day and age, the last thing you want to do is offend somebody. You know, I don't want to bring a Bible to school because I might offend the other students. And what if they're atheists? What if they're Muslims and they believe in the Quran? I don't want to offend them, so I won't bring my Bible. You know what? Maybe I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Go ahead and be offensive. Yeah. Offend people for the gospel. We need to go on the offense. You believe me? But first, before we go on the offense, let's get our ducks in a row. Let's get our scriptures down. And let's get the power of the Holy Spirit, just like these guys did. Remember how they waited for it? Remember how they prayed for it before the Spirit fell on them? If we do that as a small church, 
in, in the privacy of our own homes or together, and the Holy Spirit blesses us, we can be that witness. We can walk in that power and get people saved. Isn't that our goal here? We don't like these empty pews sitting around us, do we? We want to fill this place up and then build another one and fill it up too. Making it for the glory of God, not for the glory of us. Amen. The harvest is great, but what did Jesus say? The laborers are few. So what God is looking for in these last days, I think, is a few laborers. A few yielded people who would be like Billy Graham, who would be like Isaiah, who would humble themselves and say, Lord, here am I, send me. Think about that. So the first thing that Paul, uh, sorry, Peter said that's, that's key to the gospel is God raised Jesus from the dead. If we lost that, friends, we lost the message. This is what makes us unique as Christians. This is what makes us unique on planet Earth. Our Savior, the founder of our so-called religion, rose from the dead. The founder of our so-called religion, this is what people say about us, said that he was the only way to God. He said, no man comes to the Father except by me. I am God's gift to planet Earth. I am sinless. I am holy. I was wrongly crucified, but I rose from the dead on the third day. And now whoever calls on my name, whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. I will write their name in heaven's book, and they will be mine. And they are to go out and be witnesses and spread this good news. This is our message. But it starts with, did Jesus rise from the dead? Do we go to church to lay flowers on the tomb of Jesus? You've heard this before. To say, oh, what a great man. We honor him and his death. You know, and you know what? There's, there's a lot of people who we do honor in that way. Our veterans, our, our heroes, our firemen, our policemen, people, real heroes who give themselves for other people. We do lay flowers on their tomb. We do remember them. We light candles for them or whatever we do. We honor them. And that's good. But this is not Jesus. We do not go to his tomb to place a flower there and say, well, what a great man. If he'd only lived. If he'd only saw his full potential. He was only 33. You know, this is what some people who are ministers say and believe. I actually met a Methodist minister one time who believed that. That Jesus died too young. That he was cut off when he was just starting to get good. Can you believe that? A minister? I'm, I'm like, I looked at this guy and said, are you nuts? The fact that he died and rose again is why we're here. That's who we are. Mm -hmm. So, it, you believe me, you're with me on this point. He ha we have to recognize the fact that he did die and raise again. Are we okay with that one? Amen. So we can get on board with that. Good. Alright, right now, Where's your Jesus? A lot of people think he went on vacation. A lot of people said, well, that was hard work, you know, raising from the dead and Easter and all that. Uh, I'm going to be somewhere in another universe, another galaxy doing something else, taking it easy for a while. You guys fend for yourselves, and I'll be back in about 2,000 plus years, and I'll, I'll see you then. Honestly, there are Christians who believe that. I've heard them. They call themselves deists. You know, well, we believe God created everything. We believe in Jesus and all that, but he's not around. He's not available right now. You've got to be kidding me. What Bible are you reading? You're insane. Where is Jesus right now? He is sitting down at the right hand of our Father, making intercession for Keith Haney. Yeah, he told me that. He was doing that. <laughs> he's, he's doing it for, for Dorothy and for Goldie and for Mackenzie and Barb and even me. And you. He is making intercession for us. He's saying, oh, Father, I know Tom did it again. <laughs> but he just asked for forgiveness according to John 1, 9. And you know what? I, I see some potential in him. Let's not throw him out yet. Let's give him another chance. Thank God that I have a high priest who's without sin. Who can, who can approach the Father. Thank God that Jesus has made me holy to one day stand before my Father. So it starts with that. Jesus, our high priest, is sitting at the right hand of the Father, and he's not on vacation. Are you guys okay with that? Amen. Because if your God's on vacation, I think you're in the wrong church. 
You might find the exit there and find one not too far from here down the road, but not here. We do not believe that our God is on vacation or ever has been on vacation. So thank you for agreeing with me on that point. He is both Lord and Messiah. I think we've already covered that. The only way, the only truth, the only life. No, Tom, 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 you're so dull and stupid. There's many roads to God. Come on. This is his path. This is his truth. That's her way. And we're all God's children, and we're all going to join and sing Kumbaya somewhere down the road. Right? So why are you being so judgmental? Tom, why are you being so harsh? Why are you being so narrow-minded? You ever been accused of that? I have. <laughs> I certainly have. But you know what? My Savior said, narrow is the way that leads to life. But he also said, broad is the way that leads to destruction. I've always found it interesting that that street of all the theaters in New York City is called Broadway. <laughs> I always thought that was kind of curious. Anyway, I don't want to go there. <coughs> Maybe you do. I'll just stay home and watch television. Read the book. <coughs> Excuse me. I shouldn't be talking about Broadway. I guess that's a sign. <coughs> Our sins have been crucified with him. This is another thing we believe. <coughs> Are you still carrying your sin around with you? Are you still carrying your guilt and your shame around with you? We're going to talk a little bit more about this Thursday, so plug your ears. I don't want to ruin it. <coughs> <coughs> Went down the wrong pipe. If you're still walking around in a guilt trip, this is what you're doing. You're beating yourself up. You're repunishing yourself for your sins. You're saying his forgiveness wasn't enough. He declared me righteous and holy, but I don't believe that, so I still feel the need to punish myself and beat myself up. I mean, I'm not trying to put you down or make fun of you, but you're saying that the blood of Jesus wasn't enough. If you're living in guilt. If you keep beating yourself up, you're saying the beating he took wasn't enough. Now, in your defense, I'll say this. <laughs> There's probably people in your life, or who were in your life, who put you down constantly. Who were judging you constantly. Who were telling you, you don't measure up. Constantly. And you grow up with this image like, I ain't enough. I ain't got it. I'm not good enough. I'll never be good enough. It happens in every family, every place I go, everyone I know. I battled it myself. I'm not throwing stones at you. If you have a problem with guilt, no, I'm not putting you down. I'm telling you the truth, though. You don't need to feel guilty. You don't need to beat yourself up for what Jesus already took a beating for. Amen? Amen. Now, yeah, you can get better. Yes, you can improve, you can grow, you can change. That's coming day by day, year by year, week by week, whatever. Yeah, the, you're going to get better. And you've got some rough edges, and you've got some sins you need to deal with and be crucified to and grow. So have I. But that doesn't mean you have to walk around in guilt and shame. That means you recognize it, you take it to the cross, and you leave it there. Like Peter says, cast your cares. You know, it doesn't, you know, we think of fishing when we hear casting, don't we? When you cast in fishing, you throw it out there, but then you reel it back in. That's what we do. Here's my cares, Lord, for about 15 minutes until I can roll it back up here. And then you walk away. See you next week, Lord. I still got my care. And you take it with you. No, that's not that kind of cast. Cast it once and for all and leave it there. Gosh, Tom, that is so hard. You don't know, man. You don't know where I've been. You don't know what I put up with. You don't know my battles. You know what? I know some, but I don't know what you're going through. That's between you and the Lord, isn't it? But when you come here and you expose yourself before the cross, and you open yourself up to the Lord, I'm telling you this, He can heal you. All those regrets, all the shame, all the guilt, he can heal you. I'll tell you that from personal experience. What he's done for me, he'll do for you. Not that I've arrived, but I'm open to the possibility that I'm going to improve. I hope you are too. So can your God 
Can your Savior take away your guilt and shame? Tell me the answer to that. Yes. All right. Get to work on that. <clears throat> Our sins were crucified with him. <coughs> Another thing uh, during Peter's message that you don't hear a lot about, you'll probably hear a lot of it here because I say it all the time because it makes Helen happy when I say this. Repent! Repent! That means stop it! You know? Here's what we see in our world today. People bring their sins to the Lord, and they never deal with their sins. I am, what would you say, alcoholic, right? And I'm always going to be an alcoholic, always was one. It's in my genes, and I sit here in a pew every Sunday, but I'm an alcoholic. When I leave here, I'm still an alcoholic. And they walk around, they are alcoholics 24-7, 365 days a year. And once in a while, they'll go out and get plastered, and they'll be gone for a week or two. But they'll come back, and then they're saying, well, I'm an alcoholic. This is my problem. You know what? That's a deep thing. It's a hard thing. Not judging. For some people, it is a terrible thing. And it breaks up people. It breaks up families. It, it does so much harm. And I'm not making fun of that. But you lay that alcoholism down at the cross of Jesus. And you tell him, I do not want to be identified as an alcoholic any longer. This is just one example. There are other things. I do not want to be this. It's been in my family. It's been you know, my grandpa or my dad or my uncle. And I want it to stop right here. I'm giving it to you, Lord Jesus. Help me. I'm going to put my neck out here and say, you can start healing right there at the foot of the cross. He can take care of that sin. He can help you one day at a time. He can be your greater power or whatever. Your real, real greater power. I'm not against the 12-step program. I think it's awesome. But he can deliver you from alcoholism. I know people who have been delivered from that. He can do that. So you don't have to be in, in prison. Because that's what that is. It's like being in jail when you have a chemical addiction like that. But recognize it. As sin. It's not just a problem. It's not just my condition. It is a sin. You know why it's a sin? Because it destroys you. That's the definition of sin. I don't know what people think it is. Sin is this. Here's, a, here's your clear definition. It's anything that destroys you or someone else or puts a gap between you and God. Any behavior, any word, activity, place, person, thing, anything that gets between you and God or ruins your life or somebody else's life, that there is sin. That needs dealt with. That needs walked away from. That's what the word repent means. Walk away. Instead of going this direction, turn it around and go the right direction. That's what repent means. I think we've kind of lost that word. We think that's an old English word that just, or it's a religious word. You know, just be yourself before the Lord. He loves you anyway. Yeah, but he doesn't love the sin that's killing you. He doesn't love the sin that's dragging you down and ruining your family and ruining your walk with him. Do you get me on that? Do you agree with me or am I going too, car too crazy here? I know I'm a little nuts up here today, so bear with me. So yeah, repent. The next one is, you know what? If you've really made a profession of faith, and you really want to turn your life around, I ask you this, not to throw any guilt at you. Have you been water baptized since you've become a believer? Now, a lot of people were baptized when they were kids because they thought it was cool or because their parents made them or there was peer pressure. And that's cool. I'm not against that. But in your heart of hearts, after you have thoroughly given your heart to Jesus Christ, have you then taken that next step and said, I want to be identified publicly by going down in that water and coming up as a symbol that my old life is dead and I stand before you, a new creation in Christ. That's what baptism is. It's a witness to what has already occurred in your, your heart. You guys get me on that? I, I think baptism is important and I think it has been pushed aside a lot lately. Yeah, we want to make converts. Yeah, we want to say, see people say the sinner's prayer. That's good. That's good. But let's take them on to a public display of their faith. And let's say, will you publicly stand up here and submit yourself to a water baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? And I'm not throwing something new and crazy at you. 
If you read that story that I just read in the second chapter of Acts, 3,000 people said the sinner's prayer that day and immediately went down somewhere and got baptized that same day. And anywhere else in the scripture that I see, when someone truly made a repentance before the Lord went and got baptized, to be identified that my old life is dead in Christ, and I, ra I raise up, like I did out of that water, a new creation. You know what? I'm not trying to put religious chains on you. It is a public witness of your faith. Jesus died publicly. He bled publicly. He resurrected publicly. What are you going to do? Are you ashamed of him? That's what baptism does. It calls you out. It, it doesn't save you. But it is an act of worship. It's what we call a sacrament of the church. A sacred rite. We honor Christ in that. Does that make sense? You think I'm going too crazy? Now listen, I'm going to back up just a little bit here. There are Christians, who you probably know some, who believe that you are not actually saved until the actual baptism. And they've, I've had arguments with people like that. I really... Hope the thief on the cross doesn't get counted into that because he didn't have an opportunity to be baptized. And what if you just got saved, you said the sinner's prayer, and you're on your way to the baptismal tank and you slip on a banana peel and you fall and you break your neck and you die? Oh my gosh, he was so close. Six more feet and he would have been saved, but he's lost forever now because of that banana peel. Who was eating a banana up here anyway? You know? <laughs> it's ridiculous. Go ahead and laugh. <laughs> Is God so petty and small? Is religion, is religion just not ridiculous sometimes? Salvation is a work of the heart. All Amen. baptism is doing is showing what has already occurred in the heart. Amen. And baptism honors the Lord, and I'm all for it. So if anyone, anytime, no matter how long ago you got saved, you're not sure that you've, you've taken that step and you want to be baptized, we will get it done. We'll figure out a way to get it done. I think it's important, and it honors the Lord. And here's what I like. I don't know how you guys feel. Anytime there's a baptism, you want to invite as many people as you can, friend or foe. You want to make a big deal out of it. You want people to see someone saying, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I give my whole life to him. I believe he died and rose again. And go under and come back up again. You want people to see that. That blows people's mind. What a witness that is. Think about it. So, moving on from that point. I hope you're, you're okay with that, right? The bat water baptism thing doesn't save you, but it's an act of worship, and it's a witness, big time. <clears throat> now, the last point I'm going to make here, which Sam Haney knows is a lie every time I say it's the last point. <clears throat> My second to the last point, how's that? Is that better? <clears throat> you will be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Like, getting back to one of my original points, yeah, we're saved. Yeah, we love Jesus. We believe his word. We pray. We go to church. But we are living a hunkered down existence. We're in defense mode, right? How do we get into offense mode as a church? I'm glad you asked. Thank you for asking. It was very polite of you to ask. And I have a few notes here. First of all, the Holy Spirit will empower you. But as we've said so many times, the Holy Spirit's a gentleman. He doesn't kick your door down. Say, listen here, Goldie, and I'm coming in here, and I'm running this show, and here's what you're going to do, and here's what you're not going to do. That's not the Holy Spirit. That might be somebody else, but it ain't the Holy Spirit. He stands at the door like a gentleman. You go to the door, you open it up, and you say, Holy Spirit, come in. Clean house. Give me, tell me what I need to do. Tell me what I need to quit. You wash me, cleanse me from all my sins in the name of Jesus, and empower me to go do what you have planned for me to do. Does God have a plan for your life? He sure does. How are you going to get it done? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. Not by might, not by power, but by my what? Says the Lord. That's how we get it done. I think a lot of times we go out in our own strength, in our own wisdom, with our own charisma, with our electric guitars and our drums, and we say, we're going to rock the world for Jesus. But we forgot to ask the Holy Spirit <laughs> to come along. We forgot to ask the Holy Spirit to bless it. We, uh, we forgot to bring him with us. Did, did you bring the Holy Spirit? I thought you brought him. Oh, did you ask him? I didn't ask him. I thought you asked him. Uh, you know, 
and, and we see a lot of people burning out in ministry. I tried really hard to get people saved. Tried really hard to inspire people, but and you burn out and you quit because you didn't have the spirit with you. I've done that. Anybody else out there ever done that? Done that. You get ahead of God. Yeah, God wants to see people saved, but let Him teach you how to do it. Let Him show you. Let Him go with you. Better yet, let Him go in front of you. <laughs> That's the best way. So He leads you, He instructs you, He forgives you, and He strengthens you. When you ask Him to, when you surrender to Him, when you seek Him, when you humble yourself. These are all the things that we're not doing in America, in churches. Not humbling, not seeking, we're complaining, we're hunkered down, we're defeated, we're not more than conquerors, we're more than wimps, most of us. We're more than losers, most of us. But here's what Jesus thinks of you, more than conquerors. Through him who loved you and gave himself for you. That is your identity. That is the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Like you're doing this morning. Get fired up. Get charged up. Repent. Get on your knees. Seek the Holy Spirit. Get full of him and go out there and set this world on fire. That is your mission. Do you choose to accept it? Yes. Only one person. Okay. Maybe there will be two next week. That was my last point. How did I do? All starts with the gospel, friends. Let's pray. <laughs> Father in heaven, we come before you in this time and we repent of our sins, Lord. We, we repent of our selfishness. We repent of anything in our lives that, that has hindered us from you. Any activity, any thoughts, any idols that we've put up in our lives, anything that would exalt itself above the name of Jesus, we cast it down at the foot of your cross. Please forgive us. Please guide us and lead us. Please cleanse us from our sins. Please help us, Lord, rise out of the holes we've dug for ourselves and help us get offensive for the gospel. Teach us by your spirit, Lord, how to be brave, how to be bold, not to be self-righteous, not to just to be annoying or obnoxious, Lord, but to be full of faith and power by the gospel of Christ. Lord, that's what we want to be. Whether it's speaking or just our actions, Lord, we want to witness for you every day. Lord, we don't want to have a guilt trip here. We, we don't mind being convicted by the Holy Spirit, though. And we don't mind being corrected by the Word of God. So, Lord, be with us, Lord. And teach us and forgive us as we go about our lives. Listen to this song.
honor you, Lord, with our entire lives. Now be with us this day as we part company and get us home safely and help us have a great week. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone say, Amen. Amen. God bless you all.